Now, we haven't got any here. Do you see the duck when she comes over to lay her eggs every summer? It's a rare glimpse of the private side of a woman leader who's proud of the Iron Lady image. To her critics, she remains cold and imperious. If tea in the garden with Emily Lawson appeared staged, so too conversations with Dennis looked equally uncomfortable and fed the image of Mr Thatcher as a faithful but ineffectual courtier, rather than, in truth, the rock on whom Margaret could depend. If we have an election early, we can go on holiday in August. Yeah. If we have an election late... We won't go at all. No holiday, that's no, right. No, I'll believe well, that when I see it. Uh, I thought we'd go to Cornwall this year again, because we love it. Mm. But he was a gent, and he played at being an old buffer. But actually, Dennis Thatcher had a first-class mind about him and a very shrewd political noose. And uh, I think that also she trusted and made much of. Being married to somebody you are devoted to, who is devoted to you, is a terribly important element in Mrs. Thatcher's successful subsequent career. I've seen many a politician who falls apart when they're on their own, whether they're a man or a woman. But for a woman, it's absolutely crucial. Because otherwise, to put it bluntly, there will be a lot of speculation about her private life. There'll be a lot of pursuit in certain newspapers I won't name about who she's seeing. If she has affairs within the House of Commons, it will almost certainly destroy her possibility of a serious political career. She'll be written off as a, you know, a kind of girlfriend type or a kind of flirt type, but she won't be taken seriously. So this is crucial. I think whatever the job you're doing, you will have some worries. And if you just brood on them alone, they get much worse. You've got to have someone to talk to about them and someone to shake you out of yourself. Uh, and I'm just lucky in having it. Your husband, of course, Mr Thatcher, has been... By oh, he's advisor. terrific. <laughs> he is terrific. He drives. There's any tension in the air, you can always say, that t take the tension out immediately. Uh, mm. And you can't do all the things in, in life that you want to do. Uh, is this it's just plain not possible, both in time and opportunity? But we managed to do... Quite a Fair few. Enough. Quite a few. Both and of together. us. Mr Thatcher, are you happy with the prospect of, of another few years' residence in Downing Street, perhaps? Reasonably. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's his typical <laughs> understatement. He'd be just as concerned as, yes, I, obvious. Uh, as yes, I should yes, be. Yes, of um, course. No spouse of a Prime Minister gets a lot of attention, even on holiday. I'm here for a photo call. We're here for a photo call. Which I think we've now completed. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Mrs Thatcher continued to sweep questions aside and then rejoined husband Dennis to begin what she hopes will be a somewhat quieter week on holiday. When she was on holiday, she would only be on holiday for a couple of days, uh, recover, get some sleep, and then she really wanted to be rushing back. And she did want to say something that I thought was very sad. Home is a place you go to when there's no more work to be done. I thought that was really, well, it painted what Thatcherism was all about, about work and effort and aspiration. But it didn't have a good work-life balance at all. Aside of holidays, the nearest Mrs Thatcher came to a social life appeared to be the events organised by her public relations team, designed to promote the Prime Minister's softer side. What a lovely surprise, Prime You look better Prime than Minister. your photograph. Thank you. <laughs> you look better. May we lovely. offer you the usual? Your usual. Is that all right? <laughs> I'm on duty. Just for medicinal <laughs> reasons. No, no, I have a bit, a bit of lemon, dear. A bit of lemon. Ali? Are you going to charge him with us? Of course, she can afford it. Thanks. Yes, yes, yes. We'll drink to that. But such events were not cuddly Thatcher. Increasingly, her image was regal. Later in her career, you would see her becoming very like a queen, which I think why the queen was not wild about her, um, where she begins to treat people monarchically. If Mrs Thatcher was queen, then the cabinet was her court. Her male colleagues formed the same kind of categories that Elizabeth I did. There would be, first of all, the Grand Vizier or advisor, Willie Whitelaw. There would then be the handsome squire, Cecil Parkinson. They would then be the team of loyal young men, the Rosen Cavaliers of the Conservative Party, all in their striped shirts and their twill trousers, dying to become Conservative MPs and serve Mrs Thatcher. It's a very, very striking analogy with a powerful queen. Her regal stature was perhaps best expressed in 1989. We have become a grandmother of uh, a grandson called Michael. 
But of course, it was terribly mocked at uh, the time. But I think that uh, it was yet again the, the curious sort of blind spot that Margaret Thatcher uh, had about how people would take that. She, she didn't want to, to say, um, um, I've become a grandmother. Uh, and so she would have sort of tried to find a phrase. Uh, we, and of course, everybody thought she was behaving like the Queen. If the public image of Mrs. Thatcher was that of a would-be queen, how did it contrast with the Prime Minister in private? There was not only a real divide between Thatcher in private and, and, and Thatcher in public. She conducted an argument in much the same way, whether it was 10,000 people or, 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 or eight or nine in the room. Um, there, there was a, a myth which she helped to create because it was extremely useful to her. Abroad, it was the myth of the Iron Lady. Lady, Well, that was actually deserved. Gorbachev more or less got that right. Um, it didn't always work, but that's a different point. But uh, at home, the idea that she actually ruled everything uh, was very dominant and not so. I remember when I was Home Secretary, you used to see on the Evening Standard headlines, the posters, you know, Maggie Fury on this or Maggie Acts. And I'd buy the paper, and it was something that I was dealing with as Home Secretary, which she, actually she didn't know about at all. And, and why should she? I mean, you can't, as Prime Minister, know about all these things. Um, but when her spokesmen were asked, uh, you know, they, 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 they would give that fury or acts, because that was part of the, of, the, of, the, of the myth. She was quite the kindest person that you, you know, you, you can't imagine how... Uh, she worried about people and, and, and about their families and all the rest of it. A very good indication of the character of somebody is whether the people who work for her uh, like her. And um, all the people at Number 10 Downing Street and at Checkers and so on, they thought she was absolutely marvellous. When Margaret relaxed would be at the end of the day with uh, whiskey and soda, she'd kick her shoes off and sit on the, uh, on the sofa. Um, and then she could be, I think, very convivial company indeed. Not everyone, though, warmed to the Thatcher brand of hospitality. With Mrs. Thatcher, I used to have confidential meetings, particularly, I think, probably exclusively on uh, security-related issues. But if I was to say there was an absence of uh, emollient chemistry between us, that would be a polite way of describing it. And I was conscious once or twice that she really was making an effort to socialize. The offer of the glass of whiskey, uh, the shoes kicked off, um, and a certain coquettishness even, um, if I hope I'm not being unfair about that. But after the first 10 seconds, she knew that it wasn't making any difference, and I knew that it wasn't making any difference. So the best I can say about it, it was, as business-like as was necessary. Margaret Thatcher adhered to certain principles and drove through the policies she believed necessary to Britain's economic recovery and the restoration of its global influence. There's no thought of slowing down because we built a marvellous basis and we want to go on. Throughout the course of her premiership, her views would be challenged by, among others, members of her cabinet and parliamentary party. People who didn't know her well thought often resentfully, well, that's it, she's just laying down the law, she's dictatorial. Uh, but actually, that wasn't so. And she was perfectly prepared, provided you knew your stuff, um, for an argument. In fact, she enjoyed it. 